Right. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 24th, 2022 joint public hearing meeting uh, with both the Northampton Planning Board and the Northampton City Council Committee on Legislative Matters. Um, I'm Melissa Fowler, and I'm filling in tonight for the Planning Board's Chair, George Cohoat. Alex Jarrett is chair of the Legislative Matters Committee and the two of us will be co-chairing this public hearing tonight. As we normally do, we're gonna start off the meeting with time for public comment on items other than what's on tonight's agenda. We're gonna hold this time to a maximum of 30 minutes and ask that each person limit their comment to two minutes or less. Again, we ask that you please hold all comments relating to the form-based code implementation until later in the agenda. So at this time, if you would raise your hand, if you have a comment for either the planning board or the legislative matters committee. And when called upon, please start by stating your name and address for the record. Um, Chair Fowler, uh, should we first call do the roll call and make the announcement about the audio video recording? Uh, we don't typically do that, but sure. So okay. I guess we do actually. We yes, we do. We say uh, yes, that um, uh, we are recording this. And Alex, why don't you go ahead with the roll call and then I'll follow you. Okay. Sure. Uh, so our assistant, Laura Kretzler, uh, could you call the roll? Sure. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Moulton. Oh, Here. 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 Councillor Nash. Here. Do you want me to proceed to call the roll of planning or? Oh, I can do that. Oh. Either way is fine. Um, Krista Granat? Here. Chris Tate? Here. David? Here. David Whitehill? Here. And we have Corinne? Here. And I as well. So that's us. Yeah. And Sam Taylor is also here. Oh. I don't know if you called. Nope, Sam, I didn't see you. I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm Miss Taylor here. Okay. All right. With uh, with that, then, is there anybody that has any comment, public comment, for the time being? Okay. I'm not seeing anybody. Does anybody see anybody? Uh, there's one um, oh, hand yep. raised. I see now. Claudia Lefko. Hi, sorry. I have a question. Um, someone in the neighborhood wants to dial into the meeting. She's blind, so she can't just click on the link. Can you phone her somehow and link her to the meeting? If I give you her phone number? I just sent her the link. She doesn't, she can't find it, Carolyn. I, just, I mean, she doesn't find it on the page. She needs that. I don't know what she needs, but I just thought maybe you can from not you, Carolyn, but somebody on the board who is managing the meeting can can uh, call her uh, and. Um, uh, what's well, the I, phone number? The yeah, phone number is 413-588-8264. So I'm sorry, but she's very interested enough to be trying to do this. What do you say? Five eight eight what? Eight two six five.
Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, was that the number was not in service? Is it 413-588-8265? Oh, you know what? Okay. Let me try again. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Were there, I don't see any other hands. Uh, I Melissa? No, I don't see any. So, um, all right, okay. so seeing none, I, I believe at this point, we're going to turn it over to Carolyn Mish for tonight's, a, for no, tonight's presentation on- Oh, a I have a comment. My hand is up. Okay, go ahead, Carolyn Oppenheim. Yes, okay. Um, so I'm new to this process of uh, responding to a, a new owner coming to a meeting, hearing the plans. But what I've learned is that two things. One is I think we need more municipal education about how things work. I think the public really doesn't know and it's very complex and we need somebody in the city to translate it simply. But as I'm experiencing it, here's what is frustrating to me. So we find out that somebody has purchased a property in our neighborhood. We get information that there's a meeting to discuss the plan. At that meeting, we discover that the planning board, planning commission, I'm not sure, I think that's this body has, and the DPW have already mainly approved the plan. Um, and that if we have minor things to raise, but that the substance of this plan, plan has already been approved. And if we want to appeal it, we have to come up with a substantial amount of money to get a lawyer to do that with us. Um, and possibly an environmental engineer as well. It, it seems like a very, very heavy burden on citizens to have their first opportunity at input in such an adversarial way where the, the buyer has already been having private meetings with city officials who have essentially coached and helped that buyer come up with the plan that's going to be approved. And then the first opportunity that the citizens have to respond to it in order to really intervene, there's this enormous financial burden. There's something unbalanced about that, something not right, or we're missing something. And I've heard this over and over, so I'm, I'm confused, frustrated, a little bit angry, and I don't know if you have any response. First, uh, Ms. Oppenheim, would you state your address, please, for the record? Oh, I apologize. I live at Three Montview Avenue, Northampton. Carolyn, I don't know that we have a response or just taking comment. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, certainly. Um, we'd be happy to talk with anybody about the process, um, you know, call our office or email and um, describe sort of how, um, how the permitting process works. You couldn't do that in a nutshell very briefly so that the whole, there are other people in this call who might be feeling what I'm feeling or having experienced it that way. Um, I mean, sure. So the so in a nutshell, you know, applicants who, um, you know, property owners, yourself included, you have a project in mind, you um, want to find out what the what would be allowed, what the parameters are. Um, contact our office. We help 
um, any and all applicants through the process so that there's an understanding of what's um, required. And um, in terms of the technical review with, with someone such as yourself who might want to do an addition to their property, um, make sure that you get in touch with um, the Department of Public Works and um, maybe um, if you need a conservation commission permit that you speak with um, staff in our office who um, uh, work with the conservation commission so that you have all the information that you need and make sure you're designing your project that's in compliance with um, all the regulations. And if it requires a public hearing, then um, those um, procedures are, are on our website. We tell people what those procedures are from a perspective of, um, so that's the process from, you know, if you came in for a project and you wanted to do something. So we do that for everybody. And then in terms of the procedures, state statute sets up the procedures for public hearing and um, the process by which um, interested parties can um, appeal any kind of decisions made by an appointed board. And so that's already defined in statute and we can certainly um, go over those um, procedures in more detail with anyone who has questions about that. And the fact that you really need a lawyer to appeal it? And that they're saying it's a minimum of 30,000? I don't know what the fees are. I know people do appeal things on their, um, you know, it's, it's really up to whoever's interested in appealing. There's specific procedures that need to be followed when you appeal something to court. So, um, but I can't, I, I don't have a response about the fees involved. It's a court you're appealing to? Any decision made by a bot, like, um, so in terms of land use decisions, decisions made um, by a planning board, the zoning board, um, conservation commission has a little bit of a different procedure, but um, those bodies, yes, the appeals go and are up one level, they go to the state level, you know, the, the decision is made at the local level. So appeals have to go necessarily go up to the next level. And so that would be court. Yep. I'd like to jump in and just say, Carolyn, thank you for your very complete answer. I don't know that we have time on this call to go into all of the ordinances and state statutes on public hearings and permit, building permit applications. I mean, it's, it goes very deep and I don't think it's something we should avoid talking to at some time, but we have a lot on our plate tonight and Sorry. I think you've done a great job. Yeah, we'll move on uh, to uh, Ms. Uh, Lodi Nabad. Um, yes, hello, my name is Gwen Nabod, and I'm just here, um, this is my first meeting, uh, my first planning meeting and legislative matters hearing, or meeting, and, um, you know, I, I guess, uh, you know, I think I, I think I came to one of these meetings a long while ago, maybe about two years ago. Um, I live in public housing in Northampton, and it may have been in relation to gardens, um, but I'm here tonight and I'm here to listen. And I've looked over some of the amendments that I saw, some of the 14. Um, I generally just have a question about building up um, in the downtown area. Um, I was, when so, I read um, Miss, Miss Lip, um, I'm sorry, Nabatin, but can I just stop you there? Um, we are gonna take questions directly re, uh, relating to that form-based code later in the evening. Okay, then I guess, I, guess I, I don't really have a question. I just have a okay. statement that in my mind when I read that, I, I started envisioning Boston. And so um, it looks like that won't happen in Northampton. Thank you. And would you please state your address, please, for the record? Uh, yes, I live at 19D Hampshire Heights. Thank you. Um, Mark M. Hi, my name is Mark Mogio. I live at 445 Spring Street in Leeds. I just wanted to reiterate um, what 
Carolyn Oppenheide had mentioned about the whole process. I think the process needs to be changed because we ran into the same situation that's happening on William Street over on Dewey Court. And by time we got involved with it, we saw the little yellow sign there, everything had been uh, kind of gone over with the fire department, the police department and everything. Uh, and basically, uh, it kind of stinks that the developer gets to work hand in hand with the planners. I know that's, I guess, the way it should work, but I think that the property owners in the neighborhood and non-property owners, tenants, if there's tenants that want to be involved, um, should be involved at the get-go at an earlier stage. They should change the process somehow so that in those meetings, uh, they have more input from the get-go, from the start. That way, a lot of the issues that the neighbors are upset about could be possibly resolved before it even comes to the planning board. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mojo. Was there anyone else with a hand raised? Okay, I don't see anyone. Okay, so at uh, this point, we are going to turn it over to Carolyn Mish. She has a presentation um, regarding a package of zoning. Excuse me, there are hands up. I, I'm not, yeah, I didn't see any. I was asking. Okay, so there's that's, several. I, okay. I guess I don't see them on mine, but yes, so. Okay, I do now. All right, I apologize. Um, so, uh, Sandra Mandel. Uh, you're muted. Yep. yep. I, I, <laughs> you, someone just muted me there. Um, so yeah, I actually I see three other hands. I that do too up, now. I that do were now up, too. That were actually up before mine, but I'm glad to I'm glad to just say what I was saying, which is that um, I've run into the same issue that Carolyn Oppenheim was describing, which oh S Sandy Mandel, 64 Liberty Street. Thank you. Which is that once the um, and I spoke, I had a long conversation with Carolyn Mish uh, a while back when I first found out that some um, development that was related to infill was happening in my community. And it was way past the time when you could actually do anything to address the concerns. It, it had already been signed, sealed and delivered. And I made several different calls and was basically told, no, it's too late. So I don't understand um, when and where uh, people in the community, just regular citizens, have any opportunity to weigh in about, uh, about a process that's either happening in accordance with how you think it's supposed to be happening or something that seems to be a process that seems to be um, changed in intent, which is what I feel like we're dealing with in Bay State. And so... Um, I'm very concerned about that. It seems like the same issue is popping up all over the community and that no matter where you are, people are saying, hey, what? <laughs> How do, what's going on and when do we get to weigh in? And, um, and I'm not, I don't wanna appeal after something, someone's done a ton of work. I wanna be able to be a part, an integral part of uh, what goes on before someone is issued a permit to go ahead and do the work that they're doing that the input from the community should be just as significant as the rules, the regulations, uh, especially if we feel like some of the rules are not working the way they were intended to work. That's me. Okay, thank you. Um, Reyes Lazaro? Thank you very much. Reyes Lazaro, 172 Federal Street, Bay State. It was hard to come because as opposed to, to you, Ginevra, sorry that I mispronounce your name. I've spent a year and a half coming with my, with my fellow neighbors from Bay State. I'm feeling disenfranchised. All I want to say is my deepest support to, to people from other neighborhoods in Northampton who are feeling what we felt for a year and a half and continue feeling. And I want to reiterate the, the feeling of disenfranchisement. We have felt disenfranchised, not heard, called old, 
called, told that the meeting is not about that. In many ways, we have felt disenfranchised. That is very sad because it touches the heart of democracy. It's very serious. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Joyce Rosenfeld? Yes, thank you. Um, I have to uh, uh, agree with uh, my fellow citizens, my sister citizens who've spoken. I uh, live at 15 Warner Street in Bay State. And we certainly, as Reyes has said, um, have experienced a great deal of frustration and obfuscation and uh, the whole process seems murky and um, unfathomable. Uh, and it seems that the original intent of infill um, has uh, metamorphosized into um, development. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, Amy Ben Ezra. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, Amy Ben Ezra, 18 Dewey Court. Um, I want to join in with the comments that have been made thus far. Dewey Court certainly was involved in a long and protracted struggle about a property being developed at the end of our little block here at 34 Dewey Court. Um, we felt similarly that things went way too far in the process before we were in any way able to um, contribute or voice our concerns um, and felt like we were, you know, told, oh no, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay, or with things that didn't clearly didn't seem okay to us from our reading of special permit rules, et cetera. Um, and I guess part of my question is when we're talking about infill, are we just talking about whatever a developer wants to put up there or can there be more involvement at, of, of neighbors and the community to in, have input before the, pro, the they invest so much money in designing something and that it have more to, attention paid to ecological concerns, to safety concerns, to affordability. Because certainly in the project at the end of our block, it was very expensive housing that was being um, developed for rental. Um, and so if, if we're trying to get infill, but we want to be, maybe get infill with people who have, don't, aren't at the high end of the income range, um, these projects need to be, have more input. And I know in some communities where the developers have built something, the developers right from the start made what I understood to be sincere and genuine efforts to communicate with the neighbors and the community and try and come up with a, pro a product, um, a project that everybody could agree on, although there were compromises involved um, and that's, that's normal. But that certainly wasn't our experience on Dewey Court and it certainly wasn't our experience feeling that the representatives in the planning um, part of the city, we didn't feel like they were representing us um, in this process. Thank you. Um, we are actually at 7.30 now, uh, and we did say we were going to hold this comment um, other than um, what's on the agenda to 30 minutes. So uh, we are going to segue now to um, the agenda for tonight's evening. There will be additional time for public comment later, um, but at this point, I do want to turn it over to Carolyn Um, for the package of zoning ordinance amendments that are in front of us this evening. Great. So I'm gonna, um, I have a short um, presentation about the um, code um, amendments um, that I wanted to go over before we um, get into the details. I know a lot of people have participated in um, the public forums that we've had. And so some of this will be familiar territory, but I'm gonna go into a little bit more uh, detail. And uh, for those of you who are interested and also for those of you who are new to this process, um, 
so that you, um, there's an understanding sort of from everyone uh, about where we are in this. So I'm gonna share the screen here. Um, so tonight, um, I wanna go do an overview, as I mentioned, talk about process a little bit, and then get into some sample potential um, ways that the new or proposed ordinances um, um, might be implemented um, with new investment in both Florence Center as well as downtown Northampton, um, and look at some of the code elements and how they might be applicable to those particular properties. First, as part of this overview, take I want to take a step back to sort of how we got here. Um, this form-based code is, um, and I'll go into a description about what we mean by that, but generally this came about and as um, one implementation tool that's based in um, goals for meeting the resilience and regeneration plan. Um, first, in, um, as it relates to carbon neutrality, we know that we need to look more carefully about land use and transportation. Those two components are our greatest, there are sectors that have the greatest um, impact in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to make sure that we're creating um, places, neighborhoods um, and so forth where we're linking um, housing and commercial uses and creating walkable spaces so that we can try to um, eat away at sort of those, those bigger impacts in those sectors. Um, we wanna make sure that we're creating places that are um, accessible for where people want to go. We also need to encourage dense mixed use projects that are close to those transportation networks, um, encourage more multifamily housing, which has a much smaller footprint than dispersed single family homes. Um, also new, new investment in new construction each year, the construction um, requirements or the code requirements um, get um, better and better in terms of energy efficiency. So those new structures will be uh, consuming less um, energy to um, operate than our older structures and older buildings. Um, and multifamily units uh, in places such as downtown um, by themselves have less um, are more efficient in terms of emissions. We also, uh, as part of the goal of the resilience plan is to create and preserve high quality built environments in downtown and village centers. So that's a direct relationship to this um, zoning or this package of zoning amendments. Um, we also um, have a goal to provide dense housing opportunities in our downtowns and village centers. And that frankly does create sort of a relief valve of, of um, the pressures for providing housing in the other neighborhoods in Northampton. Um, housing demand is not going away. Um, the supply is very limited for housing, but we know we have so many people that need housing and at all levels. And so this um, package of zoning amendments will um, create more flexibility and the ability to create um, more multifamily housing options in both Florence Center and downtown. Um, so the code for a form-based code is really an emphasis over form and the relationship to the public realm or streets and sidewalks over um, the land uses that are allowed within those buildings. And so, uh, this form-based code, this proposal is really to, in that vein, to create um, different characters sort of what's referred to as character districts or sub-districts of the um, Florence Center and downtown, um, acknowledging that not every block um, is like the main um, core of, of a downtown. And so the zone, um, the zoning package looks to sort of create and, and target different um, rules and setbacks and um, um, buffer zones and things de depending on those districts. It's also meant to create predictability and flexibility so that people, both 
members of the public, as well as applicants or developers know right up front what's going to be expected through the development review process. And in, a, in effect, try to create more um, um, by right opportunities. If you follow the rules um, specifically, then you get your permit. And if you want some variation in that, you could go to the planning board for site plan review. It also establishes consistent design standards for site components related to sidewalks, tree planting, furnishings, and uses of the public space, and that relationship between the buildings and that public space, um, and also the way that it's designed. Um, and this code also um, creates uh, or allows greater uh, number of uses, again, sort of de-emphasizing use over form in order to um, address sort of the changing economic term, um, you know, realities of our downtowns and make sure that we're keeping up and allowing our, our downtowns and, and center village centers to um, continue to be vibrant and allow new opportunities for new business, small business, and sort of that shift in economic trends. Um, so the process, which you all may have heard already, we, we hired um, a consulting firm, local consulting firm, Dodson Flinker, to help us through this starting back in 2018. Um, they uh, spearheaded many focus groups and public forums with Florence Civic and Business Association, the Downtown Northampton Association, Central Business Architecture Committee, the Chamber of Commerce. There were public forums throughout 2018, 2019, and through parts of 2020. Um, we also held, or Dustin Flinker um, facilitated stakeholder meetings and business and property owner meetings to pull all of um, these ideas together and shape the code that's in front of you now. We just had our last public forum in January and um, also sort of got really deep in the weeds with both the planning board and central business architecture committee before this was introduced to city council. Um, sorry, looking at Florence and going into a little bit more detail. Um, if you can see there's this purple ring around Florence center. This represents uh, both um, for the most part, the current boundaries of the general business district. And then there's a little bit, the mill buildings along the bike path are currently zoned office industrial. Uh, but for the most part, everything else within this purple ring is currently general business. The proposed map change would be to remap this area to what would be called either Florence Village Center or Florence Village General Business District. With a few uh, minor changes, um, they're on the west end here. Uh, you've got, I put the aerial underneath this map so you can maybe make out some familiar um, lots or buildings, but the uh, Lilly Library and um, Florence um, Civic Building are in this corner. They are currently in the residential zone. We would pull them into this. Um, Florence Center Zone as, as sort of anchors of institutional um, and social anchors to downtown, as well as the formal, uh, formally used Seventh Adventist Church building, which is right on the edge there. Um, the, as I mentioned, the former mill buildings are currently office industrial, so those would flip to more of a general kind of business zone. Uh, we've also cleaned up some split lot lines, split zone lines around the edges to make sure that um, properties weren't split zoned between residential and commercial. And then this blue boundary here is sort of more of the core where we would um, create or um, basically continue the, the same uses that are in general business, restricting um, the ground floor residential component to the back of buildings or above the second, uh, the first floor. And those are sort of the core nodes of Florence Center. So in the surrounding purple areas beyond that, we would um, change what's currently not allowed for residential use on the ground floor. And that would uh, residential 
would be allowed on all floors in the areas outside of this blue frame. So those are the sort of, that's the key difference between the uh, blue um, bounded areas versus the purple bounded areas. As an example, um, there you might not see any changes on the ground right away, but so this mill building here, as I mentioned, is office industrial. It doesn't allow restaurant use or housing in this building, but bringing it into the zoning would allow um, a mix of any of those types of uses throughout the building. So, right, you, you all may know that the um, artifact cidery is there. That's allowed as sort of a distillery or production space, but they can't really have a full blown restaurant, um, but the zoning would allow that. Another example of a change of uh, use that um, would help some of these older um, structures in town is this church building could be used for office, residential, or some commercial component. Uh, um, clearly, churches such as these are a little bit hard to reuse, so allowing more flexibility with this new zone would help in that manner. Another potential um, build-out scenario, and again, this isn't, uh, or maybe I should say um, up front, there are no plans for any redevelopment in Florence Center. But this is just sort of what um, the procedure might be and where there might be some opportunities for new investment. Um, this space here in the upper left corner is next to Valley Medical. It's a, currently a parking lot. Um, if there were an opportunity in the next 10, 15, 20 years for new development, new housing, new mixed use, something like a three-story building might go there. Um, it would, there would be design review by the planning board essentially based on the parameters that are within this code. And it's a very dense code. If you, any of you have looked at it, it is, it has a lot of graphics and pictures and that extends it and makes it a very long document. It's about a hundred pages. Um, it also includes the maps and so forth. But, um, Another, and so all of those components come into play when looking at new um, construction. So that one of those components might be, for example, in this graphic here, it shows that there's a ground floor use limitation where uh, the front part of the building is restricted to commercial uses on the lower floor, but in the back, it could be parking or residential and above it could be all, all uses. And then there are other design components that or part of that review. This is another example of where, um, again, you know, this is Florence Savings Bank. Florence Savings Bank doesn't have a plan to develop this property, but if down the road, 50 years down the road, a building were to come in, um, would be desired to be there, you know, one of the components is that buildings need to take up, um, uh, encompass at least 50% of the building frontage so that there's parking to the side and the rear, but the building is really what fronts on the street and it has that interaction with um, the, the public space. This is just sort of another scenario, um, looking at that Valley Medical, the kinds of components that are in the plan that the planning board would look at, or, the, or if it didn't rise to the level of planning board review, the applicant would know exactly what they would need to design or how they would need to design to get to their building permit. So pedestrian oriented design with space between the building and the edge of the sidewalk, minimum height and, and maximum setbacks, that kind of thing. Um, another example would be a completely residential building on the, the side street. So this is just an example of where that a block might fit for a new building with again, parking to the side and the rear and then very um, sort of, um, facade elements that are identified in the, in the code that would um, direct uh, applicants in terms of how to design things. And um, the reason we heard a lot from folks in um, Florence Center in particular about how there weren't enough um, elements to, um, for the planning board to use or tools for the planning board to use in, in design review because it's a general business district. It's the same kind of zoning that's um, uh, applicable to Damon Road, 
lower Pleasant Street and some areas that are more highway oriented, but not really um, applicable to a place like uh, Florence Village, where you've got so much historic character there to, um, from which to pull and that things should be sort of match in terms of um, bulk and massing and um, character. Moving to downtown. Uh, this is a, it's a smaller map because it's a much larger geographic area, or I should say it's, it's zoomed out farther because it's a much larger, it covers a much larger area. Uh, if you can see these outlines, they're all sort of various shades of red. These are all currently commercial um, zoning districts, except for a few um, modifications, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, this uh, lighter pink area is currently all central business district now. And there are already detailed design guidelines that the central business architecture committee reviews. So for, down, for the purposes of downtown, um, a lot of the same, uh, a lot of the, all of those elements that are in the current design review criteria are carried over into this new code. And it's sort of a, a merging of those details of um, building design and orientation to the public realm, but it puts those standards in one, primarily in one document. Um, the other piece of downtown is sort of breaking it into three different sort of sub districts. So on the north end, it's dark. Whoop, there we go. On the north end, that's uh, dark red, and the south end here, this is, goes down to the dike. It's on Long Pleasant Street and a bit of Pond Street would be rezoned to a gateway district, central business gateway, which would have slightly different parameters for setbacks and landscaping components and building elements. The projects would be reviewed by the planning board instead of the central business architecture committee. This lighter pink area would be um, uh, what we're calling a side street district also reviewed by the planning board and have slightly and, and relate differently than this core. I'm sorry, what is going on here? My mouse keeps. Um, so um, th these um, elements in the cores are that main historic brick building, um, Main Street and a little bit of Pleasant and King would remain um, in the jurisdiction of both planning board and central business architecture. So, oops. Um, there are a couple of map changes here that I wanted to highlight. So Edwards Square, sorry, this keeps going faster than I can. Um, Edwards Square is the area just um, east of uh, near where North Street comes in at the corner of North and King. Um, there are, you can see the picture here in the lower left of um, the neighborhood block. It's very similar to Gothic Street where we currently have central business uh, zoning. So the idea would be to bring these, um, um, this little block into the, uh, the business zone but again, residential, ground floor residential would be allowed. So this would function very much like um, it is today, um, but it allows opportunity for potentially more housing units or some um, business if someone particularly wanted um, sort of more accessible um, from a cost standpoint uh, space to start up a business, it might be an appropriate location for that. Okay, the next slide. Um, this is another location that's proposed to, that's, um, there are two um, sections of Holly Street here that um, would transition. One is Office Industrial, which is where the lower end of Holly before it gets to Holyoke Street on the railroad side is Office Industrial. <laughs> the proposal is to bring that into the Central Business Side Street District. Um, and then there are about six parcels just north of that that are sandwiched between the office industrial and the current central business district that is proposed to bring into central business again abutting the railroad. Um, 
and those are comparable. So I've got a picture here of that sort of section, those houses, very comparable to other um, structures in the business district. Again, it allows uh, flexibility for more housing potentially, um, but also um, uh, a mix of uses. How these changes um, might manifest themselves in the in near term and long term. Um, these are currently in the general business district, these structures along Pleasant Street. Some of them are non conforming because they have residential use on the first, second, and third floor. Some of them do have office or commercial space on the first floor. However, with this zoning change, allowing for residential on the first floor would bring these structures into compliance with the zoning and also create more flexibility uh, for reuse down the road. Um, another example of potential build out, uh, this is actually a parcel on just north of Maine and King, um, it's the old probate lot but there are various um, ways in which this site could be redeveloped. But as an example of how the code would be used, this is an area that's in the core, that's just designated as the core business district. So ground floor commercial fronting the street is required. However, buildings in the back are um, not required to have ground floor um, commercial. So um, it could be feasible to do two or multiple buildings on the property with the building in front um, containing ground floor commercial as sort of shown in this, in this um, picture. And um, in this scenario, there might be another building in the back that could be um, a multi-story residential. Um, in this case, because it's in the core, 90% of the building frontage um, of the building, um, the lot has to be occupied by a building with parking to the side and the rear. And those percentages change depending on the location of the property, whether it's in the core district, the side district, or the gateway district. But in this case, the Central Business Architecture Committee would look at new construction and evaluate it against the elements in the code that deal with um, the facade treatment, the windows, the patterning of the windows from floor to, um, to roof, um, from ground to roof, and so forth. Another example, this is farther up King Street and what we are referring to as the Gateway District. Um, so a, a several different um, parts of the code would be applicable. This might this would be an area where ground floor residential would be allowed. So multifamily, either multifamily or mixed use would be allowed. It's a large uh, parcel. So there are other components of the plan that come into play and that relates to how many breaks need to be between buildings or, or how many buildings and then how what the access is like from the street through the property. Again, um, it would speak to the um, building and the total percentage of occupancy along the frontage that would be required, what type of, um, and how much landscaping and what kind of treatment is, is um, uh, created or designed between the building and the public way, also deals with public realm components that would have to be improved if, those, um, if the public infrastructure were disrupted in any way and then parking um, on the side and the rear of any new structure. Uh, in terms of other um, changes of use that I wanted to highlight besides the ground floor of residential in Florence, uh, the new zoning would allow an expanded uh, number of uses as I mentioned previously, but those include hotels, nursing homes, assisted living, um, distilleries and the like. At the same time, there are some uses that would be taken out or not allowed where they're allowed by special permit right now under general business. And that includes junk car sales or auto sales would not be allowed in the village center. 
In terms of downtown, expanded uses include nursing homes, manufacturing, as well as um, breweries and distillers would sort of be added to the list of allowed uses. There are a couple of edits that I would recommend to the planning board and city council that I noticed in going back through the code and I'm sure there'll be lots of other um, edits over time as we sort of go through this is such a massive code. It's not just the 100 page document obviously but it's the other um, 12 or 13 ordinances that go along with it that um, are more housekeeping items in the package. But the, the ones that I um, picked out ahead of this meeting relate to just sort of leftover um, site plan labels that um, should have been removed for, as it relates to ground floor residential use limits for central business side street and the Florence Village General. And so we can go into that um, with the board um, as you, know, you get into a more detailed um, discussion about it. Also, I would suggest that there be uh, more clearly stated a uh, planning board review or waiver process if uh, projects in Florence Village General and, and Florence Village Center District um, have structures that are built behind a building that fronts along the street that there could be a little bit more flexibility in uh, meeting that minimum height limit. And that is the end of my presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions. And I'll stop the screen share. Uh, Carolyn, um, on page six of your of your um, presentation, why wasn't the, the I guess I'm like my notes talked about, but why isn't the blue line just more continuous? There's like a I don't know if it's possible to go back to your presentation. Uh, are you talking about uh, Florence Center and the yeah, map? Yeah, Florence Center. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I will pull up uh, maybe a more clear picture of the map. It's it could be that um, it, it could be just a graphical, a visual thing on the graphic. Okay. Um, but the actual map in the code, um, uh, proposed code, is this. Do you see the bright pink boundaries? It might be easier to see now. Yeah, I guess um, I was. Why aren't the bright pink and the like? There's two bright pink areas. Why is that not? Oh, connected along. Connected. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a lot of discussion about sort of where the concentrated areas of commercial um, development, where it made sense. And we wanted to make sure that we left enough area along Main Street to allow um, for more dense housing opportunities mm -hmm. to help support those businesses. And um, so by sort of get, keep creating, in a sense, two nodes, um, where there would be only commercial on the ground floor, but allow more flexibility between those nodes for um, multifamily residential if the market demanded that. Um, I think that was sort of the main um, reason for, for creating the nodes as opposed to, you know, a continuous area for that. Carolyn, is that the only distinction between the light and dark pink? Um, yes, it's the ground floor use limitation um, uh, portion. Okay, thank you. Because, because I, I mean, I, I had the same thought as Sam, because I kind of think like, oh, pie bar is included because it's pie bar, and that's sort of like. <laughs> It doesn't yeah. seem to be the right way. Like, what if someone wanted to put ground floor housing where Pi Bar is in ten years? Like, why isn't that allowed? That just seems kind of weird. That like we're just taking a snap. Some of the issues we're dealing with in planning over the years is like, oh, planning was written at a certain point in time, so that becomes this like very special time that everything always has to match up to, you know. And we're sort of doing that. I guess you always do that to some degree. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, also just sort of thinking about sort of strong entryway intersections and having that, so that's the entryway into the main part of, of Florence Center. So 
um, that's where um, um, I think how that came about. And then that other sort of main and maple is the other sort of strong intersection there. So if everything is sort of, um, if, if the focus is really sort of um, pedestrian um, interaction for commercial uses at those corners, that was the idea behind that. I mean, sort of similarly in downtown, we, um, on, on the east end um, where Holly Market and Bridge come in, um, Central Business Architecture Committee had a discussion about making sure that all four of those corners of that intersection were brought into the core um, of the, um, or what we're referring to as Central Business Core. And that again was related to having sort of that strong commercial presence at that, at the, all four corners of that intersection. Yeah, I mean, I guess philosophically, it's sort of like, isn't the whole point of this is not to legislate use as much? I mean, I don't know. So why, <laughs> why, did, why are we doing that? Why can't um, there be housing there? Um, there, uh, the idea is sort of, I want to answer your two, there are two parts. So um, yes, generally the idea is not to dictate you so much. However, there's a big difference in sort of that interaction at the street level. If you have sort of a dead space during most of the day because it's a residential use as opposed to a more active and alive space at, um, along the core. So it's not, it may be um, the idea is really to generate activity and um, interaction for you know, uh, a good part of the day, as, as opposed to when you have a residential use where it's really much, um, it, there's not the same kind of uh, vibrancy there. Okay. I'm sorry, I, one, one more question, because it, it, I'm sure it's in the uh, other 100 pages, um, but the, um, one of the, and there's, I, I understand there's not a lot of development there, but what, what, what is happening at all between, I guess, Pi Bar and Cooley Dick? Um, I mean, I think of that as like a slightly, of, of all the areas that I'd like to see brought, you know, bring, to bring sort of the town together. I'd like to see something there. Well, there are a couple of um, issues, I guess. I mean, you've got this sort of village center that yeah. um, need that, um, you know, the shape of retail or the concept of local retail has changed dramatically and has been changing for the last 25 years, right? So the demands are very different now um, and so we have a lot of space and opportunities already in the village center. And I think um, um, from the perspective of wanting to maintain that concentrated village center and not sort of bleed out um, and then you lose the, that, those great buildings and spaces because there's just too much um, area allocated for um, those opportunities. That's one piece, um, we want to continue to support our existing downtowns with um, reinvestment opportunities there. The other piece is creating separation. Village, the Florence Village is different from Northampton. Um, and so having that little bit of a break says, okay, we're transitioning to a different place now. The other piece of it is there's the, I mean, there's Smith Book Fields there, there's wetlands. Um, there's some constraints there that just don't um, allow for any of that development anyway. Councillor Nash, got your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, Carolyn, thank you for the presentation, very helpful. And um, I know that a number of my constituents in this presentation would be interested in under, in, as well as myself, is understanding the step down. So you have 
we have the central core, you know, which I believe, you know, many of the diagrams we're speaking to as well as the side street. And, you know, if we could get a sense of what going from central core to side street to URC to URB in terms of, of you know, height, size, open space and parking requirements um, that, you know, cause those are the, I think those are the things that people are most concerned about. And that um, anyway, if, if you could just speak to the, that transition. Sure. Currently, Central Business um, has a 70 foot height allowance. Um, there are no parking requirements for most uses. I think the only uses that require new parking are for theaters and hotels, I think. Um, there are uh, buffer requirements um, for the um, rear of properties to between uh, central business and urban residential C. The proposed change would um, set in the side street. So, so now the, the proposal is to break the um, one single central business district that is all of that area that touches urban residential C into three um, different districts. So the core district would not touch urban residential C. The uh, central business side district um, and the gateway district would continue to abut next to residential this urban residential C. The height limits would or uh, allowances would still be what they are now at 70 feet, but after 55 feet there would be a required step back of the structure so that really what's abutting those um, districts would be a 55 foot height, which is the same as what's allowed in urban residential C now. And then after 55 feet, there would be a step back of the building so that it's not the entire massing that at the, at the setback line, but it would be um, 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 the building would have to be sort of projected in inward from that. Um, open space currently, the open space stays the same as central business now. So there's no change in that. It's um, except there are uh, more specific requirements about landscaping um, between the building and the sidewalk, which we don't have now in the central business district. Um, I don't know that speaking about the step, you know, the changes between URC and B is part of this conversation because there's nothing there. Um, actually, in Florence, um, Florence um, Village um, districts, they would abut urban residential B, and um, the same, the sort of similar standards that are in general business and those separations would stay the same. There's still the same. Um, actually, the heights would um, uh, are comparable, so that really isn't changing much either uh, between um, uh, the new zoning classification and urban residential B. Thank you. And, and what is the, what's the open space requirement again for side street and, or gateway? So um, there's not a, um, it's, it's all in the landscaping. So it's not a percentage um, per se. Um, but I'm just gonna pull that up and sort of talk about that a little bit. There are um, uh, tra buffer, transitional buffer requirements that are about depth and the type of plantings in those. Um, currently, central business has 0% open space requirement. Um, and so that carries over. We're not making anything um, more stringent than what's currently allowed. I do wanna acknowledge, I do see some hands up from the public. Um, and before we go to public comment, we are, um, I just wanna check with the rest of the board members and the counselors to 
do any of you have any questions or comments that you'd like to input before we open up for public comment? I just want to say thank you to Carolyn for um, the answers. Yep, Councillor Jarrett. Thank you, and thank you, Carolyn, for the presentation. Um, you mentioned some of the additional uses in, in uh, Florence Village um, and the removal of uh, some auto dealerships and such. Um, what about gas stations? What, what areas uh, would new, obviously new gas stations, existing ones could, would continue? Um, would, that, would those be permitted? Are there any changes there? Um, let me just pull up, just make sure I'm getting this correct. Um, just one second. I believe it's special permit currently in the general business district, but let me just confirm what it says here. Um, So um, there's auto auto repair. So there's sort of two different categories. There's auto repair um, without gasoline sales, and that would be a special permit. Um, currently, that's site plan, um, or and that's in a core. That's that's for this village, uh, Florence Village Center, and then in terms of general, let me just um, look, I know you said gas stations in particular, gasoline sales. Um, um, I had made notes on all of these of which ones um, stayed the same and different. So I'm just running through that. Um, sorry, take me a second here. Um, Um, I don't see the gasoline sales on the list, um, but we have, um, so it's just auto repair, but I can take a look at it and um, it, while we continue the meeting, so we don't hold up other questions, but I'll put that on my list of things to look for. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, then mm -hmm. a question about um, the status of historic buildings. I know in the central business uh, core, the Central Business Architecture Committee would continue to have quite a bit of say about uh, any demolition or mo modifications, extreme modifications. I'm not sure where the threshold is to historic buildings. Um, and I know that we're, this, as a city, working on a, a broader historic preservation plan. Um, could you kind of describe the, um, the, I don't know, the status of, of that in relation to uh, and and the the different protections for different districts. Um, I guess my concern would be that we might see more teardowns of historic structures uh, without the corresponding historic preservation plan in place to protect them further. Um, so one of the ordinance amendments uh, uh, that's proposed is would be language to um, change in the um, I think it's chapter 150, it's not 156, it's um, somewhere around there, it's in the ordinance packet, is to modify, because right, right now, the Central Business Architecture Committee has a review and jurisdiction over demolition of any structure in the Central Business District. Um, and his historical commission has jurisdiction over 100% demolition of buildings outside of the central business district. Um, so the um, ordinance amendment um, for um, that would, the language change, sorry, to um, uh, chapter 161, which is um, the one related to um, historical just historic um, historical commission's jurisdiction, 
um, remove, would essentially review 100% demolition um, for anywhere outside the Central Business Architecture Committee District. So it sort of um, shrinks where Central Business Architecture Committee's jurisdiction is to a smaller geographic area. And that the historical commission's jurisdiction is the one year demolition delay? Or did they have any additional powers? Historical commission um, reviews demolition. They can opt to put a one year delay on 100% demolition. Um, they don't review partial demolition, if that's what you're asking. Right. Um, and then, yeah, my other question is kind of the status of the historic preservation plan. I don't know if that's maybe outside of the scope of, it's not, it's not directly related, but my, you know, I, my concern was, was about um, what, what effects might have, this might, might happen. Um, so I don't know if you have any information about that status, that plan and what that might bring to us as far as preserving additional historic structures? Um, so I think that we, I think we have a bid out to um, hire a consultant to help us with that, but we haven't, um, we haven't, I don't think the bid, bidding's closed yet. So we're still, you know, moving in that direction. But the idea is to identify resource, you know, important resources. So it's not, sort of a grab job of sort of trying to figure out as they come up what's important to have a further discussion about, but to sort of create the foundation and understanding of what makes sense in terms of um, 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 trying to protect those resources. You know, where are those valuable resources? What is it about those neighborhoods or resources that are important? And then sort of, set the parameters for how those things get reviewed or don't get reviewed. So yes, it's a completely separate process. Thank you for that. Board member David Whitehill, got your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, so like, I, I totally agree with what one of the commenters in our first part of this meeting said about how complex the pro this whole process is. I mean, as someone who works in the industry, I'm constantly amazed at how complicated it is, and I cannot even imagine how it is for the, you know, the quote unquote civilians. Uh, so to that end, we're creating this whole new way of thinking about how we write zoning here for these areas. So to what degree will this be like a clean swapping out? Or are there exceptional moments when it's possible that development teams will have to rely on, will have to comply with this plus big pieces of the old zoning. Like how much are we simplifying and where are we actually making things more complicated? I don't know if that's a clear question or not. It's clear. <laughs> um, we're, there will still be elements of the old zoning that apply. So the parking requirements or, um, um, signage or um, there are a whole host of other things that are part of the zoning that are applicable across the city and those still apply. The things that are really sort of pulled, uh, this is really a focus more on form and design and um, public realm standards for these down, for our downtown centers and then the table of use. Um, so it's probably I don't know, making up a number, 90% of what someone needs to know to build the project, but there'll still be some elements that are in the um, rest of the zoning code that are applicable. Okay, do we have any other counselors or board members? I don't see any hands raised other than public at the moment. All right. All right. In that case, um, at this time, we will open up the meeting to public comment. Um, I just want to remind 
everyone again to please start by stating your name and address. And we would ask that you try and keep your comments to three minutes or less to give everybody an opportunity to speak. Um, and we'll start with uh, Amy Ben Ezra. Melissa, I, just a yep. point of order. It dawned on me, have we opened the public hearing and do we, do we need to, can we do that now? Um, and um, just, I, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we're operating as a public meeting. Um, I, um, I, I just, do we need to formally have a motion? Maybe Lorik or, or, or Carolyn can help out with that. I'm not sure if we did that, did we? Maybe I missed it. Yeah, typically there's no motion to open a public hearing um, in the planning board. Well, the okay. chair opens the public hearing. Okay, thank you. Good. But if you council, need to we have do that, that if you need to do that, I mean, it probably makes sense if you feel like you need to cover your bases. Um, I'll certainly... offer a motion to open the public hearing <laughs> for, for the legislative matters. Second. Uh, uh, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, um, Laura, would you call the roll? Sure. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Elkins? Yes. Councillor Moulton? Yes. And Councillor Nash? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I think we're ready. Um, Amy Benezra, please, you're up first. Thank you. Amy Benezra, 18 Dewey Court. Uh, thank you very much, Carolyn, for your presentation. Um, this is obviously a huge, huge undertaking. And um, I also watched a video that was circulated um, with a long, an hour long presentation about what this form, whatever you're calling it is. Um, it's not clear to me what the gains are of this approach versus the losses. Um, and um, so that's kind of a question I have is what is the, what is the city thinking is the gain for switching to this form of um, zoning process? Um, and also in the specific, when you showed your maps on my, at least on my screen, it was very small. And I couldn't really see where certain streets fell in the purple lines and so forth. And I'm wondering if you could show a slide of downtown Northampton again, um, maybe enlarge it or something. Cause what I'm curious about is um, for example, I live on Dewey Court and I wanted to see where Dewey Court fell in that purple line and then to understand what, what impact this um, different kind of zoning approach would have on Dewey Court from what had been discussed over the last couple of years, particularly related to the development at 34 Dewey Court. Thank you. I think we're gonna uh, take all your comments, um, sort of group them together and then um, we'll address or take under advisement after that. So up uh, next, I see Claudia Lefko. Hi, I'm Mac Everett. I'm Claudia Lefko's husband. And we're going to uh, share our computer tonight. We live at 40 Valley Street in Northampton. And I'd like to start by saying that I, well, I want to direct my comments to the parts of the plan that involve densifying residential housing and adding infill basically. And I wanna start by saying clearly, I'm, I'm not against all infill, especially when used to create affordable housing. I think infill can be thoughtfully designed to fit well into existing neighborhoods. And we have two fine examples, Main Street type of examples on Pleasant Street, Lumber Yard and Live 155 that have brought more than a hundred new units online. We also have an entire new village on Hospital Hill with lots of green space, incidentally. 
um, where the hospital had been situated. Um, and it's been a huge addition to our housing stock. But as you all know very well, there have been some um, very controversial and concerning aspects of infill that have uh, come up in the city over the past few years. Um, Alex mentioned one, the, the integrity of historic buildings and the, the controversy around St. John Cantius and the possible demolition and replacement of it with very high-end luxury condos. Um, we've seen the concern in Bay State around um, functional small houses on reasonable size lots being demolished and replaced with $750,000 or more houses. Um, so uh, that's been a big concern. And in my neighborhood, lately we've been dealing with the proposed development at 107 William Street where a small house on a quarter acre lot is going to be, has all the permits in place to be torn down and replaced by eight condominiums, eight half size condominiums essentially covering the lot with either building or Parking. driveway. Um, you know, and, and that's a big concern here. This, this type of project means the loss of space for kids to play, loss of shade trees, wildlife and pollinator habitat. And in a time when we wanna bolster local food production, why would we wanna encourage paving over of garden spaces? We think about the role of victory gardens in the winning of World War II. Gardens are also a natural tool in our fight against climate change, not to mention the profound and well-documented mental and physical benefits of working the soil. In the case of our neighborhood, the soil happens to be floodplain soil that's reputed to be some of the best in the world. And unlike on Pleasant Street or Hospital Hill, side street projects like the kind we have down here and would be on the edges of the downtown area of um, of Florence. The projects here are surrounded by an already stressed and decaying infrastructure that looks unlikely to be built soon, unlike more Main Street projects. So, you know, again, many concerned neighbors of mine see and accept the need for more housing and are not against thoughtful infill. But we think in, a, in an area like ours that has one, two, and three family units, those are the kinds of infill infill projects that make sense, accessory apartments and those. When we see eight units crammed, shoehorned into a space where there was one unit previously, that to us is overfill. It's not infill, it's overfill. It's too much. And uh, before I go, there's one other point I wanna make and that is we talk a lot about densifying our downtown for reasons of enhancing you know, transportation and access to uh, shopping and so forth. Let's think for a minute about what happened during the pandemic when people, many people started working remotely. Many people started shopping online. I mean, you can do those things anywhere. You have Wi-Fi. You don't have to be there in the center of a downtown area to do those things. And I'm just wondering if people have thought about in the long run, as those trends appear to be continuing, what kind of uh, impact that will have on our need to keep centralizing people when people can be on the periphery. So, and I, I will also finish by saying sprawl. I'm concerned about sprawl too, but I'm really concerned about people losing their garden space. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Everett. So Claudia Lefko, cohabitator here at uh, 40 Valley Street. I'm very concerned about the central, about the issue of the historic district and restricting it. Our neighborhood is one of the oldest in the city, Montview neighborhood, and one of the most historic. What is historic? Like I wanna propose a Howard Zinn vision of history here. It doesn't have to be a building that's by a, a significant architect or even a significant structure. Our neighborhood is of historical significance. On William Street, where Mac is talking about this project, there are five houses designated as by the Historic Commission. So still the committee voted three to one to, to demolish the house at 107, that the property is insignificant. And I'm very concerned that this is going to be expanded, that more houses will be demolished. 
Um, I'll say that our, our vigilance in this neighborhood, even we're an angry neighborhood, we're a very proactive neighborhood and trying to protect what we have here. And it's, we've worked for over 40 years with city and developers to preserve what we have here and keep it so that now we're a major walking area in the city. I mean, if we hadn't been vigilant all these years, we would already have all these developments here, but we've been proactive. So because of this development going in at 107 William Street with all this coverage, I went to the sustainable, to North, sustainable Northampton and I just started reading through the plan and seeing how does this relate to what's being proposed in my neighborhood. And I'll just tell you what jumped out at me. And I'm going to read directly from the sustainability plan. Adapt, adopt land use patterns that concentrate development in neighborhoods supported by adequate infrastructure, which we don't have here. Encourage development of neighborhood organizations, support their participation in the planning of their area. Protect and preserve the city's heritage resources from de degradation or destruction by public or private actions. Protect, these are all right from sustainable Northampton. Protect the city's historic and architecturally significant neighborhoods. Provide information to decision makers and the community on loans, grants, and other ways to property owners for the restoration or rehabilitation rehabilitation of heritage resources. This could have been very useful at 107 if somebody could have suggested to the owner, he might find some resource. Preserve a diversity of housing types that define the historic development of the neighborhood. A stack of condos is not, in, is not consistent with the historic development in our neighborhood. This Ms. one- Left Co, we're gonna have to ask you to- oh, uh, yeah, no, I'm only, uh, okay. Operate the city as a democratic enterprise that is responsive and responsible to the fiscal, economic, social, and environmental interests of its citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gwen Dabad, please. Um, yes, I just had a few thoughts um, as I was kind of looking through the the planning and stuff. And, you know, first of all, I just want to say that what she just read off is so important that there is that democratic process. And I live in public housing and, um, you know, it's, 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 um, it's not in these areas, I don't think. But um, if there can be a voice for people um, who are in housing, and I think in the increase of the design of the housing, I think that some of the human needs need to be considered. Um, I think that um, earlier I heard that going, you know, anything underground or anything that's below the level of the surface of the of the land um, would not be considered a floor. However, maybe it would be more energy efficient to consider that possibility of of building a little lower into the ground in areas that could be okay for that. Um, another thing that I was hoping that we could talk or we could hear more about tonight um, is the sort of landscape and buffer zoning sort of things and um, those requirements. And also I noticed um, there were some, some things in there about tree requirements. And so I would like to hear more about that. And I will also, um, you know, I think that the previous couple said, Exactly my sentiments, exactly, thanks. Thank you. Um, Joyce Rosenfeld. Yes, um, I, I don't know if this is uh, uh, appropriate to, to bring up right now, but when I heard um, you, Alex, uh, Jarrett, ask about gas stations, are we building more gas stations? Um, in in our area, don't we have enough gas stations? That's my question. Uh, 
Melissa, you're muted. Thanks. Uh, um, I didn't ask you, uh, Ms. Rosenfeld and Ms. Nabod, to um, state your address because you had previously, uh, but I do want to remind people to do that. And next up is Deborah Berkovitz. Thanks. My name is Deborah Berkovitz. I live at 41 Warner Street in Bay State. And uh, thank you, Carolyn, for the presentation. I can only imagine how much work has gone into this. Um, I had a few observations that lead to a couple questions. And um, <clears throat> I'm wondering kind of how much we look back historically and try to learn lessons from it and then think about, um, I think as uh, maybe David said earlier, it's very difficult once um, regulations are put in place to make change. And it seems like one of the things that those of us have been distressed with what happened with the infill, the infill zoning was that there wasn't, um, that, that there wasn't a, a, a mechanism to be able to <clears throat> look and see whether or not it was accomplishing the goals that had been stated or that residents felt like they were signing on to when they um, you know, came out in favor of it. And so I heard about healthy mix of uh, commercial and residential um, and mixed use in the presentation. And I think Hospital Hill is, which somebody else mentioned, I would say is, was an egregious uh, example of where we were told repeatedly that there was going to be mixed use, mis mixed commercial use, small retail, and that didn't happen. And so when I look at this presentation, I think about first floor residential. I think in five or 10 or 15 years, we're going to have very few in-person businesses left to walk by because there's so much money to be made in that first floor residential. Um, and so, you know, if if part of the goal is to have mixed use in a healthy economy, is there um, are there checks and balances to be able to see what happens over time and revisit the zoning. Um, also, um, you mentioned the historic character and that the bulk and, uh, of Florence Center, the bulk and massing of the buildings should match. And that is pretty much the identical language with the infill that we then tried to challenge in Bay State when the bulk and massing of the properties that were developed by New Way, that were built by New Way, were not consistent um, with the neighborhood. And there was no teeth to that language. And so I would say if that's a goal there, we haven't so far seen that um, really put into practice um, in past projects. And then um, uh, thinking about what's happening also with the environment, which I think a lot of people have concerns here. Um, you know, some of the development that we've seen, uh, you know, um, has has cut down, I've approximated about a thousand years of tree growth, including the trees that uh, many of us here in this meeting fought hard to preserve, uh, which were taken down this week at the corner of um, Federal and, and Warner, um, uh, that, that, that really incorporating thinking about about uh, what it means to be taking down trees in this city and that replacing them with tiny saplings, uh, which in some cases are planted way too close to buildings, they'll be taken down soon. Um, you know, that that should be an integral part of any rethinking zoning, that we need to be greening the city rather than graying it, which is really what a lot of this is about, you know, graying it or browning it. Um, and lastly, when there was a mention in the first slide about, um, new buildings being more energy efficient, all that says to me is, is that the uh, other piece of that is taking down, um, I mean, nobody would dispute that, but, our, but I have heard Carol in particular talk about the fact that old buildings are inefficient and we would be better off having more new buildings built to the stretch code um, and construction and demolition degree, uh, debris result in over 3 billion square yards in the landfill each year and actually it's very, very clear evidence that repurposing old buildings is by far the most environmentally uh, friendly mechanism, way more than building, than taking down old buildings um, and building new ones that are more energy efficient. And this is another piece of as the city works on sustainability that I believe should really be part of the sustainability plan is how do we preserve our existing buildings because that is in fact the most energy efficient thing that we can do for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John Skabisky. Yes, can you hear me? I can't, we can. Okay. My concern is that after listening to the presentation is that uh, uh, 
mentioning the loss of green space in the inner city or community in Florence Center. The, the thought of, of losing that garden area next to the Florence Bank, to me, is, is would be saddening. It's, uh, we need some inner city open space. We had a problem downtown in Northampton a few years back where they wanted to put apartment houses, uh, let's say infill, at Pulaski Park over there. Well, that uh, didn't uh, happen, fortunately. And we have a, a, a nice green area in downtown Northampton. And I'm afraid it was pointed out where the parking lot is uh, there at the medical center in central Florence uh, for an apartment project probably in the future. Uh, I would think that the medical center would be there for eternity. Uh, people are gonna need that. And parking is an essential part of their operation and it keeps other spaces open for uh, people interested in shopping in downtown Florence. I would hate to think that they, that would become an apartment uh, a site uh, and with the loss of parking for those people that have to have that, uh, have need for that medical center. Uh, downtown open space gives the appearance of calmness and, and beauty, even if it's a small area. And uh, uh, you take that uh, space uh, next to Smith Charities on Main Street, just walking by there is, is kind of refreshing. And it makes for a unique community. If you have some green space, open space, garden area here and there in the community instead of just all brick buildings one yellow one green one red and you know uh, my thought is I, I i hope that we don't have to give up those spaces in the inner city just to have a factory outlook house after house after house and and that's supposed to represent being very attractive and beautiful. I would question that. The uh, I would say that uh, if we have to have more activity in a downtown area, that we should really be thinking about taller buildings instead of four stories, six stories and your infill would go up instead of out. That would be my thought of perhaps solving that problem, but I mainly would not like to see the loss of the green space wherever it is presently. And, and uh, uh, to look at the Florence Civic Center, it's got a spacious lawn over there in, the, in a parking lot, that's beautiful. And it should stay that way. We shouldn't cram it with buildings over there. This adds to the community. And my suggestion is that be careful about too much infill and the loss of green space, green area, garden area that would keep the communities attractive. Thank, thank you, Mr. Skibisky. We are going to have to ask you. To, and would you uh, state your address, please, for the record? Pardon? Oh, my address is 50 Hastings Heights, Florence, Mass. Thank you. Okay, I'm looking for hands. Um, okay, yep, Miss Oppenheim. You're muted. Carolyn, you're muted. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, so a question and a comment. The question is, I got confused. I don't know where that space is, if you've referred to that space that's next to the Lilly Library where the farmer's market is in the summer. Is that a space you've referred to? Oh, hello? Hello? 
Sorry, is that a question for Sorry. Yeah. Carolyn? Yes. Yeah. I was just the, the spaces you've referred to, is one of them the space where the farmer's market is held in the summer next to the Lilly Library? Are you asking the previous? Um... Well, I'm asking, maybe I'm asking Carolyn Mish. Um, do you want a response now? Um, and this is a question to the planning board. And yeah, just the yes or no or question. Do you want, uh, uh, do you we'll, want to wait till the end? Yeah, we'll wait till the end. Oh, okay. Yep. I just wondered if that, I, if that's one of the spaces that's referred to that could be built on, or not. And the other, the comment I wanted to make was, it seems kind of odd to make an emphasis on drive-through parking for the bank when the whole emphasis in these districts is it's walkable and it brings people in to walk and then there's this sort of protection for the bank to have drive-through parking. I thought that was kind of odd, that's all. Thank you. Uh, yep, I believe uh, Sandy Mandel, yep. Sandy Mandel, 64 Liberty Street. So um, in Bay State Village, uh, Carolyn, in, in the first part of your presentation, I was struck by how much it reminded me of the early conversations that we had in, uh, in our community about infill, where it talked about walkability and sustainability and keeping green and making sure to promote affordability of the homes. I, actually, you didn't say anything today about the affordability of the homes. I'm not talking, when, when I say affordability, I'm not, I'm not talking about low-income housing specifically. I'm talking about affordability and I don't know where that fits in any of this. But I was really, I just found myself wondering about that because of the development that has happened in Bay State over the last two years, the, as as Deborah was talking about, the number of fully mature trees that have come down has been astounding. It just feels like a travesty, and it feels like where is the where is the accountability? How how is that uh, how is that how is that um, accounted for? And it, that that when it was taught in the beginning of the presentation, talking about wanting to be able to adapt to um, various sustainable forms of energy. But we know that some of the houses that went up recently on in Bay State were, were positioned so that they will never be able to use solar. And I was just struck by, again, where is the accountability between this, the goals that we state that we want, the overarching goals, and then the various, it seems like there's a terrible breakdown and that when there was this type of breakdown, that there was no way to, to stop it or to ask anybody, how, how do we change this? How do we address this? Um, and I know that when we were talking about infill originally, we were talking about houses that were connected to houses that already existed um, to create more affordable rental property. And I didn't hear that being addressed in today's presentation. I'm hoping that that can be talked about more. Um, but that uh, it, it, it just reminded me, Carolyn, a lot of, of a kind of conversation that we would have to get a lot of people in this community on board talking about walkability and sustainability and um, affordability. But that in reality, that is completely not what happened in Bay State. And when we raised questions about all of these issues, we were told that this type of, per, that the permitting allowed for this type of development. And that's incredibly concerning to me. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Sherry Taylor. Hi, my name is Sherry Taylor. Can you hear me? Yes, please state where you live. Yes, 25 Edwards Square. Thank you. Um, I. Listening to this has been fascinating because it's very clear to me that the people who have spoken both in the Florence Center in, in the Bay, Bay Village and also south of uh, Main Street um, are in a different situation than I am. I chose this because I wanted an urban environment. I wanted walkability 
and I'm incredibly happy with where I do live. However, because all the homes here are so old and so non-conforming to current zoning rules, I have not been able to do any of the things I've wanted to do to my house because the zoning rules have always really fit suburban type homes. And this change is something I really welcome. I mean, it's time to be able to put a garage in or a small apartment that uh, can be used for renters at a uh, relatively moderate means. And I'm saying this because I'm in support of this entirely. Thank you. Um, we do have a couple of um, questions to address, I believe. I don't see any more hands up at the moment. Okay. Um, so Carolyn, maybe you'll help me through some of these. Um, I know there was one question asking for a little bit more um, depth and information on landscaping and buffer zones and trees and the differences of uh, in the different areas of those. And then also the, the question that just came up about the open spaces, particularly in Florence, um, particularly the farmer's market area, would that be affected at all by these zoning changes? Sure, I made some notes of other things as well, but um, I could start with that. Um, first, let me say that the existing, and this covers some of the um, other comments, the existing zoning in, let's, in either downtown or Florence Center um, allows for development, um, allows for, um, you know, building with 5% open space with building to 55 to 70 feet. So for example, um, the examples I showed as, you know, potential locations for new buildings aren't about um, a plan by Florence Bank or anybody to take away that green space tomorrow with the zoning. But I will say the current zoning would allow that. The difference between the current zoning and the proposed zoning is that this then speaks to the concerns that we've heard about the fact that there aren't design parameters and form standards for um, when new buildings get built. So we heard a lot of complaints about the Cumberland Farms. We heard a lot of complaints about the one Main Street project um, because in the general business zone, um, there aren't specific uh, criteria um, about how you orient your building, where is the door located, how much space do you need between the sidewalk and your building, and what goes in that space? Is it um, green space? Is it, um, you know, is it plaza area? What's the interface there? So, in fact, the, the this zoning says we'll keep essentially this, the allowances that are there now but we wanna add features to the design review and design parameters that then allow the planning board to um, respond to those um, concerns that the public brings to public hearings. And, and you know, there weren't and there aren't currently standards in general business. Um, so, um, and so if the market demands a new structure or, or if someone uh, is a property owner and wants to build something, they can do that today. This isn't about, um, um, th this really just sort of defines it better based on the community input about what people wanted to see in their in the district. So the Florence, um, the Lilly Library area, it's currently zoned urban residential B. It would come into this area, but uh, these are institutional uses owned by, you know, the library is um, a separate property. It's not, it's, it's not that this zoning would then encourage development on the library lot. It really just says this is part of the, this is a cultural part of the village center. And so it should, um, you know, be wrapped into that. Um, in terms of, um, um, tree plantings, we have existing requirements. This speaks to what um, David Whitehill asked about before, like what parts of the existing zoning still remain. So 
um, tree replacement requirements for trees over 20 inches um, still is an issue. If there are trees that would be coming down at that size, there is a specific calculation that is brought that um, must be followed. There are parking lot standards, so any new parking lot would be required to um, contain landscaping between the aisles, and it can't just be, you know, um, many of the um, lots are just um, continuous asphalt without being broken up by um, planting. So those that's the kind of standard that would be applicable to any new developer that development that comes forward with um, a site plan to the planning board. Um, let's see. Um, there was also a question about um, there were a couple of comments made about, um, I guess the gains versus the losses are sort of the same thing that sort of, I wanna go back, I think my answer about the fact that the current zoning allows development. And so this zoning just carries that forward, but with more specific um, criteria. So it's not necessarily that, um, we're, that there are um, trade-offs per se, but it's just, um, better defining and also creating these sub-districts that maybe speak to the character of, let's say, Con Street is different from Main Street, so we shouldn't be treating Con Street with the same design criteria or setbacks or build two lines that we have on Main Street. Um, I don't know, were there other questions, Melissa, that you um, wanted to me to address? That, that covered what I had. I, I had asked about Dewey Court and where it fell on that map. If you could pull up the map and show me where it falls in that. Yeah, Dewey Court remains urban residential C. The boundary of the central business district doesn't change when it tran transitions to central business side street. So that edge is the same as it is today. Okay. I, I also just want to point out that like everybody in the state of Massachusetts can go onto the website and look up their property and find it. And I don't think we should be focusing on people's specific, you know, gripes and specific properties in this conversation. Um, Elaine, oh, where'd you go? Uh, there was a hand up with, for Elaine Mogio. Did you want to say something? Yes. All right. Yes, I do. Okay. Go ahead. I, I'm Elaine Jundu from 42 Hubbard Avenue, and I live in Ward 3. And I just wanted to bring up the fact, going back to Carolyn Oppenheim, about how we as Northampton citizens aren't aware of things happening they just happen. It's like the city planning board works with the developers before the city citizens of Northampton. It, it seems like everything works before it comes forth to the citizens of Northampton. And a perfect example of that is St. John Cantius. I am the one that started the petition to stop the demolition. And the rectory and the parish hall came down before anybody in this town knew about it. It happened during COVID and nobody knew anything about it. It just happened. So it's just a big question mark that I have why these things happen without the public being notified. And it, in the rectory is a historic building. So I don't understand why the CBAC committee decided to take it down. Can, That's can, you just rem okay. remind you. To, can you remind people to mute, mute their Zoom when they're not talking? Okay, so how this works is when the public is, is finished with comment, then we close the public hearing and then we talk amongst the, the planning board and the legislative committee. Um, so I, okay, I see uh, Claudia, Claudia Lefko. 
Thanks. I, can, can you comment, Carolyn Mish, about the historic district and what you're recommending? Um, recap for, for us what the changes are and why, please. Thank you. The, the historic consideration, like you were talking about, there's going to be more, less, less, I don't know, just explain again because it was hard to understand. Thanks. Um, because the, the way that um, chapter 161 is written is that um, the historical commission only has, has jurisdiction for 100% demolition, not partial demolition um, of historic structures anywhere except in the central business district, which is where the jurisdiction of the central business architecture committee has jurisdiction over uh, removal of projects. Since the um, Central Business Architecture Committee um, review geography is changing, it's going to be smaller um, than the, um, that means that their jurisdiction would also shrink and that historical commission would um, have review of 100% demolition for areas still outside of the jurisdiction of the Central Business Architecture. Sorry. So how does, can you, how does that going to impact? Uh, will there be more, um, more concern about historic buildings, where it, old buildings or whatever, or there'll be less concern in the new zoning? Um, it's, e it's easier I, to demolish or harder to, to demolish with the new zoning? I don't think there's a change at all. Um, I wouldn't say it's harder to demolish in the current situation. Um, there's just a different body to review it. And um, the, again, the most that, the, as you know, the most that the historical commission can do is place a one-year delay that doesn't prevent demolition. Um, and that wouldn't change. That's not being proposed to be changed. Okay, thanks. Um, I also just want to, I think there may be some misunderstanding, but this, the zoning is about the commercial floors. It's about sort of making sure that we are staying up with the trends. Um, you know, yes, people are, I mean, the very, uh, our concern as a, as a city and a community is to make sure that our downtowns remain vibrant as the core, as the center. And so we know that um, retail is not a strong force um, as it was before. So we need to be flexible to address those and allow flexibility and uses and create other opportunities for um, encouraging people to come downtown. And so that's the big focus of this, as opposed to um, just um, continuing to require, I know there was a question about um, um, mixed use and there'd be a transition to residential. The city doesn't control um, the private property, so, but we want to allow flexibility in the types of uses so we can um, um, change over time as the market conditions change. Okay, uh, Mr. Mogio. Hi there. Um, just a, a quick question about, you may have mentioned it already, but the field, when you come into Florence and somebody had mentioned the Smith Folk fields that are beautiful on the left-hand side as you're coming in towards Florence, the state building that's on the right-hand side there, I don't know if that was mentioned or if that's even part of the Florence project at all. Um, uh, in what's going on with that uh, and how would that be zoned or what is it zoned now or whatever. I'd like some sort of clarification on that. And also another comment that I just have is I noticed that a lot of the boards and whatnot are getting diminished uh, in, in the city or you're streamlining processes so that it doesn't waste uh, developers' times. This happened with um, during our uh, 
our Dewey Court thing. I don't want to be specific to that, but it's happening all over that uh, people uh, um, don't have to go before certain boards anymore so that they, uh, people meaning developers, so that they can streamline and get their projects put through faster. Uh, it just seems as though I think our planners in this city should be working for the residents as well as the developers. And I don't feel as though a lot of the residents are being heard enough. And that's a real big problem in the city. And I think we really need to start to address that because ultimately you're working for the residents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn, there was, um, Mr. Rogio asked about a specific piece of land uh, in Florence. Excuse me, I, I actually wanna to respond to that. I, I'm on the planning board and I've been on the planning board for a number of years. And I do feel like I'm working for the residents of, of Northampton and making the process as smooth as possible. So I would like to strongly push back on that just because someone had a bad experience with a certain project does not mean that the board uh, is working in cahoots uh, with, with um, some sort of evil developer. In fact, in, in the case of the Dewey Court specifically, that is an actual resident of Northampton. Um, and so I think we need to sort of temper, temper our discussion and, um, you know, remember that, you know, we are a positive board that is working with, with uh, the residents in mind. Um, okay, just, just, just to ahead. answer that question, um, the, that parcel is not part of Florence Center, so it's not part of this. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we've we've got uh, we've got hands up now that have been two and three times. Um, I want to ask that if you have any more questions that are specifically related to the zoning amendments, to please speak to those. Uh, we did have open comment earlier tonight that was for items not related to uh, these this package of zoning amendments in front of us. Um, so having said that, um, is there anybody wanting to make a motion to close the public hearing? Councilor Jarrett? Uh, could we do that separately where the planning board, the planning board would close theirs and then legislative matters can uh, debate about whether to close ours? Absolutely. I just want to make sure we've, I don't see any more hands given that last statement. So planning board members, does... I, I move to close the public hearing. Second. Okay, so uh, we need to take a roll call on that. Um, Chris? Yes. Krista? Yes. Corinne? Yes. Uh, David made David? Yes. Sam? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So, Councillor Jared, do you want to uh, debate that at this point or just have us discuss yeah, Matt, amongst the board members? I'm happy to hear uh, if, if, if there is interest from legislative matters to also close the public hearing or to continue it to our next meeting in April. Jim, Councilor Nash. Councilor Jarrett, you're using our more uh, less, our less formal approach to discussion. Yeah, um, so um, I'm not sure if I, I wanna close the public hearing because we could continue it over uh, with, with legislative matters, which I think we next meet on the 11th. And um, that, uh, but we also in, in terms of legislative matters, we invite lots of public comment as well. So I, I'm gonna make a motion that we close the public hearing with the idea that we're also not stopping any further 
public input on this as well. And um, so mo I'm making a motion to close the public hearing for legislative matters. Is there a second? I second. Um, so I would say, is there that that would that comment have to be in our general public comment at the beginning of the meeting? Or could we also, even though we've closed the public hearing, can we have uh, any sort of back and forth with the with the public? Because my understanding was that that wouldn't be the case uh, if if we close the public hearing for this item. I think that you you would have to if you want to continue to have public comment on this item, you would want to keep your hearing open and not close it. Okay. Jim, what's your thoughts? Well, uh, ben? I, I, I think uh, then let's keep it open. And you could officially continue it to your meeting. So if you yeah. want to continue the hearing, you would do it to the date and time um, spe specified. Yes, okay. So I would like to withdraw my motion if that's okay with the person with uh, Councillor Moulton who seconded that. Are you okay with that? Yes, yes. Okay. And that uh, I would like to make a motion to continue the legislative matters portion of the public hearing to the 11th. I'm looking at my calendar. It is at 5.30. I second that motion. Any discussion on that motion? Stan? Well, I think, I think there's value in continuing our hearing because there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of issues raised tonight that I think uh, I want to think more clearly about over, you know, over the, uh, the coming weeks before the 11th. And uh, I think, you know, I want to encourage uh, hearing from uh, uh, from other people who may not have been uh, able to attend tonight's uh, session. Any other discussion? Jim. I think this is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's more public discussion and um, and this is a this is a nice option. So uh, thank you for clarifying that, Carolyn. Um, so we didn't shut things down. Yep, and I'll chime in to say I agree. Um, I think that this is a very complex document. It's going to take people a long time to get to know it, um, including including myself and the other counselors. And um, so the more we can spread the word and hear from the public, uh, I think that'll, that'll give us a better outcome. So seeing no more discussion, uh, what are we, oh, Jim? Uh, just one more thing. So um, Carolyn, you, you could help us out here. Um, so if we keep our public hearing open, then you guys are gonna do some discussion right now. Can we engage in the discussion? Um, you've continued your hearing. I mean, um, uh, well, wait, so um, you could engage in the discussion. You're still taking public comment, um, to public hearing comments in two weeks. So um, you can certainly stay and listen, ask questions. Uh, well, actually you couldn't ask, um, <laughs> you're hearing the planning board just closed its hearing so um you can certainly stay and listen because now it's just a discussion amongst the planning board members and they've closed their hearing okay all right thank you for clarifying because uh, i like talking to the planning board <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sorry, when I when I moved to close the public hearing, I didn't think I was closing it to the city councilors. That if this is a joint session, is that, did I misunderstand this? Well, the problem is, David, is that we if we leave op if we continue the, our hearing, then that has to continue to include the public. And so, if y'all have closed yours and we haven't closed ours, then then 
then we we cannot continue to take public comment as part of our hearing. Um, I mean, I, well, I mean, I will say that I have, I have, um, I, this is probably my fifth or sixth, um, in-depth presentation on this, on, on this material and these, uh, proposals. Um, so I, I am, you know, and, and I've heard from many of these commenters, uh, and the public and, uh, at multiple times from before. So I would be comfortable closing, uh, you know, closing our part of the hearing too, but I am, I'm not prepared to, if, if other folks want to carry it over to the next legislative committee meeting, I'm, I'm fine doing that, but it does mean it kind of makes it difficult to have, for us to continue to have this conversation. Yep. I mean, I guess I would say that I, I, I value the joint conversation with the planning board as sort of the next process in, in, my, in, the, in our deliberation. And I, um, and I'm eager to get on with that. And I don't want to ask the planning board to come back for a further joint meeting. And so... I mean, they're just listening. They can listen and they can take what they want from it and be the be the elected officials they are. <laughs> and and just so that everyone understands, I want to clarify. So the process is: planning board makes a recommendation to full city council. Legislative matters also makes a separate recommendation to full city council. But typically, legislative matters likes to be sort of the last stop before making their recommendation to city council. So it's often the case that legislative matters continues either its discussion or the public hearing itself plus discussion to another time, um, particularly on um, bigger zoning changes. You know, smaller ones, you guys have sometimes have joint hearings and just dispense with it all together in the same meeting. Thank you for that clarification. Um, so unless there's any other discussion or desire to change, uh, I would go with the motion on the floor to continue the public hearing. Seeing no hands, uh, Laura, would you call the roll? Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Uh, legislative matters has one more item uh, that if we could just dispense with that one, then we can adjourn legislative matters and the planning board can continue as, as they wish. Does that make sense? Yep. Great. So uh, the item is the approval of the minutes of November 8th, 2021. Can I have a motion to approve those? I have a motion to approve. Second. Any discussion on those minutes? <clears throat> Roll call, please. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. And so now we would have a motion. Could I have a motion to adjourn the legislative matters portion? So moved. Second. Roll call. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay. Thanks very much. We'll be, I'll be continuing to listen for sure. Uh, and I look forward to your uh, discussion, but thank you. Yes. Thank you for all the thoughtful um, discussion um, so far. I'll continue to listen. Absolutely. Okay. So to the planning board members, um, do we have discussion, comment, questions? My understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Carolyn, is that we have um, 
a choice tonight to recommend to adopt these amendments to the full city council as is. Uh, we can also recommend to do that with any changes that we may have. Um, or we can recommend not to. Right, or if you um, didn't, I mean, you can also say that you wanna take it at your next meeting, but that is after legislative matters, um, right. continued public hearing. Right, so we do have the option as well to continue the public hearing on our, on our side. Not a public hearing, just your discussion oh, and discussion. recommendation. Okay. Got it. Okay. So what do the other board members think? I think they seem like pretty reasonable updates that I, I would vote to recommend. Um, I am confused, I guess, about what the point of this meeting was. Uh, I think we heard one public comment that even referred to the form-based code at all. I mean, I know other people have comments about other things, but, and then we're not really having a conversation with legislative matters. So uh, I would vote to strike out all references to mansard roofs in the uh, text and approve the rest. If this was a vote, I know it's not a vote yet. <laughs> I, I agree with David. I. I not i sort of feel like we we got sidetracked um with a larger discussion of, of infill and not um this the changes directly talked about um but um they, they seem they seem uh good like good perfectly good changes and i would recommend that we move forward with them Okay. Chris, Krista, anything you want to add to that? No, I would say I agree with both David and Sam. I think that I think the changes seem reasonable to what the goals have been laid out by the town are. We did get a little sidetracked. Um, I think there were some important comments that were made by the public, um, but they didn't necessarily pertain to the exact thing we were talking about tonight. So we did get a little off track, but I would say that I'm okay with uh, the zoning changes as we've laid them out. Yep, I have, I have no comments. Okay. Can I ask a question? Uh, and this would be specifically to David um, about the Mansard roots. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think mansard roofs in certain situations are really nice. And I think it's, I understand pizza huts from the 80s are ugly, but like you, if you, ha maybe if you want to add something about like it has to be a three or four story building or something, uh, there's some beautiful mansard buildings uh, as part of Smith campus all along Main Street. I wouldn't want to retroactively make those crimes against the city of Northampton. So uh, I think it's a really kind of silly rule. So I would take it out. And, you know, I don't know, we saw this development on William Street. I know it had some really strange roofs because of the, you know, solar ready part of the zoning. Um, but I actually think a mansard roof in that building would have made it look a lot better. So <laughs> anyway, I just think a mansard roof is a nice design thing. And I don't think, you know, Dodson and Flinker should limit other architects from using it in the future. And, uh, you know, I'll... I don't know. So I won't let me die push by back. that though. <laughs> yeah. It, it, so it wasn't I mean, it wasn't Dodson Flinker in particular. They're actually it's in the existing central business architecture guidelines um, mm. to discourage mansard roofs. And they're the but there may be mm. another way around it. So I yeah. think it's because of the total um, you know, the roof component becomes the building instead of the building with a mansard roof. It's just mansard roof and then a tiny little building underneath. Right. If you have and a one so, or two story building, that's the case. If it's a three or four yeah. story building, it's a totally different animal. And, yeah. you know, about 40% of Paris has mansard roofs, you know, and they have some pretty bad urbanism, right? So, uh, yeah, but yeah those I agree. Two. If you want to those limit it to one built. or two story buildings, I'm fine with that. Okay. 
Um, I mean, because I think there's a way to do that to um, specify, sure. as you said. So, so anything okay, over, anything below um, three stories can't have a mansard, or something like that. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So, David, would and you be interested? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Carolyn. All right. I was just going to say I had mentioned um, a couple of other edits um, that I would recommend, and the one is there was it. Um, I think it's an error because it creates a conflict where in the Florence Village um, Center and and I think the Side Street District, it says that you um, in what it basically says there's zero feet for um, you could have a ground floor residential, but then it says it, it requires site plan. And um, it's clearly not intended to trigger site plan if you're doing ground floor residential. So I just wanted to clear that up in the table. Would you be okay in push in um, uh, voting to recommend that modification as well? Okay. Um, and then what about allowing flexibility for buildings that are not on the street front in Florence Center to, to be a less than the minimum 20 foot height if, it, if the planning board approves it through site plan? These are, so they're not buildings fronting on the street, there'd be second or buildings or behind an existing building if it's a lot created by itself in the back. Would you, would you put a, uh, a dimension in there? I mean, you don't want the old west sort of a uh, fake storefront thing, right? Um, right, like so well, the way the standard is written now or? is there's a minimum, 20 foot minimum, and then a maximum. Right. So I'm just suggesting that you could put um, an additional comment in there that if you want to do less than 20 feet, you first have to get approval from the planning board. And it can only be a case in which the building is behind another building. Otherwise, you need to meet the 20 foot minimum height. Does every, but in, under the current rule, does every part of the new building have to be 20 feet minimum? It's or it's just the roof line. I mean, you could have a part of it that's less, right? So the way that, so it's not about roof line now, there's actually no minimum in Florence Center. There's a minimum in downtown and in along King Street. And so it's basically pulling those minimums and, and also having a minimum applied in Florence Center. Um, and uh, so that, part is new. The minimum is new in Florence. Okay, I guess what I mean is when I say the existing, I'm saying the existing way it's written that we're reviewing, like the draft. Oh, sorry. The 20, the, the, if, if the current rule is really a 20 foot minimum at the street, not, not behind the street wall anyway, right? Like you could have a 30 foot building and then it steps down to 20 feet, 60 feet back on the lot. That wouldn't be a non-compliant thing, right? It's not a 20 foot minimum right, over I mean, the, that would be the whole like, building anyway. Right. The idea is that it's at the street, but it doesn't, um, but this is for a, deta a, a new building. Let's say it's a completely separate building, or maybe it doesn't have street frontage. So that is not specified. So you don't need frontage in this district. You don't need to be on a street to build on a separate lot or to build a separate building. So it's really for the buildings behind the street that I'm asking about whether that makes sense or do you just want to keep it as is and to your point or to your question height is taken to the roof line of a flat roof or to the midpoint of a gabled roof so as i'm understanding it you're talking about like a building like there was a building and then there was a parking lot behind it and someone wanted to build a building in that parking lot because you have to mm -hmm. access it obviously somehow. So it makes sense there that you would have to have 20%, I guess, or le 20 feet or less because you do want, you'd still want there to be a, a commercial component of in that behind, like behind the, the commercial space it will be flexible and that it would be a minimum so you'd have to have 20 right now the way it's written is any new building anywhere 
-hmm. minimally has to be 20 feet, but it could be up to, you know, I think it's 60 feet. Um, and so, you know, maybe it's not a big enough issue to even warrant discussion, but um, it, um, and, you know, the other thing is if it, it, it may, it may not ever come up. Um, and um, 20 feet isn't that, I mean, the idea is to make sure that we're encouraging, you know, taller multi-story buildings. Um, and then we're not getting one story buildings um, anywhere in our downtown in new construction. So the idea is like, if someone builds something in Florence Center under the new zoning and it's 30 feet at the street, are they allowed to build a 12 foot high garage in the back of the lot? And we would just want to say that could be okay with site plan review? Yeah. Okay, I'm fine with that. I wouldn't want them to have to come to the site plan review just for that though, that <laughs> seems silly. Well, but you, well, I mean, it depends on, how, you still have to be in site plan once you hit 2000 square feet of construction. So your parking oh, garage example, fine. it would be there anyway. Okay, then fine. Okay. Anybody want to take a swing at a motion? <laughs> Can I, I move? I would move that we recommend the draft form based code uh, limiting the limitation on mansard roofs to buildings of two of lower than three stories. Uh, and I don't know, Carol, you'll have to help me with this last 20 foot thing, but uh, allowing uh, buildings below the 20 foot high minimum height uh, with site plan review. Was that it? Uh, and just take away the site um, plan requirement for ground floor residential in the oh, side right. street districts. Right, and to and remove the- Florence Village okay. Center. Right, and to remove the site plan requirement for first floor residential in the side street and Florence Center districts. All second. Okay. We have a second, so we'll take a vote. Uh, Sam? Yes. David? Yes. Corinne? Yes. Krista? Yes. Chris? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Okay. Um, Carolyn, do we have anything else? I don't think we got minutes, right? No, but we have an A and R, and then easement um, acceptance um, as part of a street. So, um, am I allowed to make a general comment before we go to those things? Is that I don't know if that rules of order works or not, but. <laughs> Yes or yeah. Okay. I guess that's a guess. I, I just want to put in, I, I don't know if who's still on this call, but I think it's really important that, I mean, there's a huge effort multi-year as everyone heard to, to making this change. And obviously um, there's a lot of people who really believe in it. And I think it's a really good thing uh, for the process. Um, I do think we should, I, I want to send this to legislative matters and the city council with a message on the side saying, I think planning department should work on some very, very simple, easy to read guidelines on how zoning works in the city, like everything on one eight and a half by 11 page. We don't have to get into every detail of things, but it's really important to make this easier for people to understand. It's too hard. And I know what all the reasons why it's too hard, but I really think the people of Northampton who really want to be involved and pretty much everyone I've met in Northampton wants to be involved in very good faith. Uh, I think people would do well and actually would look at it if it was something that was, you know, clear. So anyway, that's not in the motion, but I think it's important. I would agree with that. It's a good comment, David. It's a good so comment. Can you can I just ask? 
Can I just ask for clarification? You're talking about this zoning in particular or just generally? No, I think it's, I think it should be for all zoning. Um, New York City did something like this about 10 or 20 years ago, um, like one pages for each zoning district. You know, there's lots of ways to do it. But, you know, this one kind of lends itself because it's already kind of graphical and stuff. But um, in a sense, it should be easier for people to understand their zoning and how it works, you know, and then it's just a really hard topic. It's not an easy task, Carolyn. So I know like it's, it's something you have to allocate resources and resources to do. So um, I didn't want to hold up this process with that, but it's, I think it's really helpful to, you know, all these references to the democratic process. Um, you know, this is a very complex industry that involves public, a lot of capitalists, uh, you know, private um, forces, huge international market forces. There's a lot going on. So the more we can make it clear for the parts that Northampton's adding to the complication, you know, that's better. So. So Carolyn? Uh, yeah. So um, there is one, this is a series of a and R slash easements. Can you see the plan on the screen? Um, it's several pages, and this um, this is this is a different A and R than you've seen before, um, because they're little strips and bits of land uh, along um, several streets in and around the Bridge Street Schools. I'm just showing you, um, there's Parsons, this is along Parsons Street, um, also going across um, Bridge Street to um, the other side um, of the neighborhood. But there are all these, um, this is all part of the project for which the city received funding to improve the walkability to the Bridge Street School. So it's referred to as a safe street, safe streets to school um, project for Bridge Street. And it involves sidewalk improvements. And in some cases, taking little bits, um, expanding the sidewalk. And um, so these survey plans are not creating new lots, but it's required as part of this public project to identify the areas that are actually going to either going to the public way or um, are already part of the public way but aren't defined as such. And so um, there, are, there are several sheets that are actual, um, our, the city solicitor suggested that we need to do an A&R for these easements. So there's not really land transferring, but it's really sort of, a right or an easement that will be sort of permanent because it's part of the right of way that will be transferring to the city. Um, and then there are parts that um, will, will be needing to come as part of a street acceptance. Um, the, the planning board, city solicitor's interpretation is that the planning board needs to vote to recommend a street acceptance to city council before the city council takes these other little bits and pieces. <laughs> So um, I have the three plans here. And so basically you would be um, voting again, one to endorse that these are not subdivision plans that are not creating new, um, no new streets are being created. Um, and then the other part of the, um, the, the second vote would be a recommendation to city council that the city take these, uh, the bits that are needing to be taken for the street and that it's recommended that the city do that. Any questions on that? None? Okay. So I would vote to endorse this plan. I second. And, and it's a second vote for the recommendation you're saying? Yes. Yeah, it's a separate vote, yeah. Okay, got it, all right. Okay. Okay, so Sam, you second? Yes. Okay. okay. And then I guess we need a roll call. Yep, we'll go for a roll call. Uh, Krista? Yes. Corinne? Yes. Chris? Yes. Sam? Yes. David? Yes. And I vote yes as well. 
And then we're on a roll, I guess. Uh, I recommend that the city take the bits and pieces, is that the technical term, uh, to make whole the city streets or something? <laughs> Got it. To make right. the streets whole. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did I miss that? Did somebody second that? No, nobody that? agrees with me. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> Okay. Sam, Sam, Sam second. Sam yeah. seconded. Uh, so voice vote, David. Yep. Corinne. Yes. Chris. Yes. Sam. Yes. Krista. Yes. And I vote yellow. Yes, as well. Is that it? Right. That's all I had. I did not get you the minutes. Darn. <laughs> I read a whole thing so, so your next meeting is April 14th. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, if there's not anything else, does somebody want to move to close the meeting? So move. Second. All righty. One more time. My goat. Hey, are you liking this is free collection? I saw you had something in the shower and yes. you said yes. <laughs> yes. Corinne. Yes. Krista. Yes. Chris. Yes. And I vote yes as well. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>